Hi everyone, my name's Lisa um, and I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank the College of Nursing and Arjo for facilitating me to come here today and speak to you all a little bit about um, bariatric preparedness. Um, just a little bit of a heads up about me in the first instance. Um, I've been a nurse for almost 30 years um, and I've developed my interest in bariatrics over the last uh, several years. A, because I was a, a bigger person myself. I'm, I'm not uh, shy about the fact that saying I've had bariatric surgery, so I think I do have an understanding of some of the um, challenges that our bariatric patients experience. And um, I run an equipment service at um, the facility where I work, so often challenged um, trying to prepare and um, uh, cope with these patients when they present to our facilities. Um, I just, um, we're going to have time hopefully at the end for some questions. So if you have questions, if you could um, uh, send them through um, electronically and um, we'll address those at the end as, as we can. Um, okay, and we'll get started. Okay, so from woe to go, I'm sure we've all been there, um, of a two o'clock of a Friday afternoon where we um, have a patient come into our ED or into our, our community service and uh, all of a sudden they're much larger than what we expected. And so there's like this mass panic that goes on um, and how are we going to cope, how are we gonna get through this? Um, and if we get things right and we are prepared, um, we have the right equipment, we have staff that are trained, etc. we end up in more of a calm situation like this and um, we are then ready to go. And, our, and we actually do our patients a whole lot better service. Um, and um, there's not uh, the angst that's associated with it. So it is all about being prepared. So I just wanted to share a little bit about um, our journey where it started at my facility and I do work in an acute facility. So please, uh, the, all of this is transcribable to community facilities, et cetera, as well. So outpatient departments, et cetera. So it's all transferable, I think. But a little bit about our journey. Um, in 2009, we had a lady called Maureen who was admitted with a lower limb cellulitis. So a fairly simple diagnosis, um, except she weighed 260 kilos with a BMI of 82. Um, she still had a very, uh, a bit of mobility at home. It was pretty limited. Um, but we had really no equipment for Maureen. We certainly didn't have a hoist or a sling that fitted her. Um, and due to um, the severity of her cellulitis, um, she was unable to mobilise initially. And then because we left her in bed for six weeks until we got some equipment to assist with mobilising, she'd actually deconditioned significantly. And um, she ended up staying with us for a total of 18 months. So from something very simple, um, uh, she was with us for that amount of time. She actually went on to lose 100 kilos while she was in the hospital with us. And she um, went on also to become a consumer advocate for us. So we would hold um, bariatric training days. And Maureen would come along and speak to us about um, what it was like to be a bariatric patient in our hospital and where we had got things right and where we got things wrong. And um, the staff found that quite challenging, but it was it really opened their eyes to um, some of our behaviours and our, whether we were prepared or not. So as you can, and at that point, um, from a lot of what we learned from Maureen, we learned that we really could do better and that we needed to do better um, because really, realistically, she was the tip of the iceberg for us and we knew that um, people were getting bigger and that we needed to um, have a plan to move forward. Um, I found this diagram one day while I was hunting to do another presentation and it actually encapsulates a lot of what we um, were, uh, try what I was trying to articulate and how we can actually plan, use it to um, plan for our bariatric patients that are coming in, et cetera. And I am gonna to speak to some of these, but at the end, I am probably gonna uh, draw it all back to how this is, affects mobility uh, as one of the issues for bariatric patients. Um, this is certainly not where we started. I think we, uh, we were very reactive um, and uh, putting out fires essentially when we first started. Um, so if any of what I've learned along the way can help any of you, that will be really useful, I'm sure. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll just talk to you through some of this stuff. Um, I think first off, if the care of the bariatric patient is on your, isn't on your organisation's risk radar, then you, that's your first problem. Um, and when I say organisation, it can be um, the small community facility um, that is seeing a bariatric patient come in for some allied health treatments. It can be a major hospital, it can be a little rural hospital, et cetera. 
Um, but if you have not even thought about these people coming, then that's where your first um, problem is. Um, have your organisation uh, thought about building capacity for, to care for bariatric patients or clients in um, your services? And when I th talk about stuff like that, it's, it's specialist equipment, it's care environments. And some of this is really challenging when you first get going, um, that um, care environments, uh, we're often trying to fit people into uh, uh, facilities that are already designed, et cetera. And we haven't, certainly haven't been built with specialist needs like this in um, mind. Have they thought about a go-to person or a service to serve as a source of expertise? How do you refer your patients? Um, I know that some uh, health services actually don't accept bariatric patients above a certain weight and that those patients will be referred on to a larger hospital. So maybe it's a birthing woman who exceeds a certain weight. Um, she can't go to her local hospital. She'll be sent on to a specialist um, referral centre for stuff like that. What are some sort of supportive programs does your organisation have in place, like fit for surgery, um, healthy eating programs, et cetera? Um, all those sort of things are important and uh, need to uh, be on your radar. If you don't have the right equipment, then you're going to end up in um, with problems and poor design is a, a thing that we all live with, I think, as well. Um, if you have uh, redevelopment teams in your um, in your services, I suggest you make friends with those and flag the needs of these patients early on because uh, if they can at least be on our radar, then we can plan better. And um, it actually ends up a whole lot safer for the patients and for the staff. If we can get these patients to be happy to present to our services, then they're often um, don't become as ill. So if you're thinking about an acute patient, acute patients often delay presentation because they're worried that they won't have the equipment. Um, they're embarrassed about their size, they're worried how people um, will treat them when they get to places, et cetera. Um, so you need to have a, a service that patients are comfortable to attend. Um, so a lot of do not attends in this um, situation, bariatric patients often can't get to where they need to go, so to a clinic appointment, et cetera. Um, so that's some of the things that you need to have in the back of your mind, why these people aren't coming and, and what we can do better. So this is a um, very bad picture of me, sorry. And um, this is us, uh, so I am part of our go-to team and you can see the gentleman on my left there, who's our uh, manual handling coordinator. So he's a actually a physio by trade. Um, what we were trying to do here is we actually got flagged a patient who's coming in for a PV exam in the operating theatre. Uh, and this lady weighed 260 kilos and had a very large abdominal panis. And it was likely that she wasn't going to fit on the operating table. Um, it had enough weight capacity, but not enough width. And we weren't confident in the extensions we had. So we had to try and plan before this lady came in, because you can imagine this is a very delicate procedure. She was going to be awake for this procedure as well. And um, we didn't want to have to be trying to be fluffing around while she was actually uh, in a, quite a compromising um, position. So we wanted to have something very firm on the table before we even brought this lady into our service to um, see how we might be able to do this with minimum of fuss. Everyone was confident in their task and what equipment we were using and um, that we could get it done very quickly and in a dignified and safe manner for all that were involved. So this is the sort of things that you t uh, your experts in the thing, uh, your go-to people could be working through. Um, and it could be as simple as something about how we're gonna get someone via the community transport into a clinic appointment. But it is about having, knowing where your needs are and someone to troubleshoot and work through those things. So there'll be more bad photos of me to come. So um, if you don't have any sort of procedural documents to guide the care of the bariatric patients as well, um, I think that's another gap in care. Um, we certainly have a procedure at the facility where I work with talks about acute admissions into our service um, and how they might move through uh, various ward areas or um, uh, talks about manual handling, talks about nutritional needs, et cetera, et cetera. So any procedural guidelines you develop will be very much dependent on the service you offer. If you're working in aged care, if you're a community service provider, and they need to address those very those issues. You need to think about what are your key messages for staff. So even simple things like who is bariatric? And our procedure um, where I work is very nondescript about that. Um, people really want to hear a number about who's bariatric. They want to hear that that's a, a weight of 120 kilos or a BMI of 40 or whatever. 
Our um, procedure actually says if they don't uh, can't access services and don't and don't have equipment that can manage them effectively, then we could perhaps consider them bariatric. So it's much more than a number. So if I don't fit in a chair or I don't have a bed um, that I can fit in comfortably, then um, perhaps I need to be considered bariatric. Um, because some of the people um, these days can be quite short and have a high weight, and that um, creates its own set of challenges, whereas the weight might be 120 kilos, um, which may not seem as bad as 160, but if you're a lot shorter, it is. Um, it's just about fitting equipment and, um, and different uh, bits like that. So what are your key messages for staff? A lot of it's about safety, I think, in our procedural documents, but it's also about how you interact with your bariatric patient as well. Um, and talking, um, a, a, I often warn our patients when they come in, because uh, I assess them pretty much when they first come in, is that um, not all staff are used to dealing with bariatric patients and some people can find it very challenging um, and that the staff may need help with that as well. So um, staff need to be very aware of uh, the psychological impacts that they can have by um, talking about the patients in the hallway where the patients can hear. One of the messages is I say, they might be fat, but they're not deaf. And I use the fat word because, you know, it's just something that's a word I use um, because of my previous experiences. Um, and I think that's really important. I think we don't pay enough attention to that. So uh, when we've got a circus outside of eight people talking about how we're ever gonna move this person and stuff like that, um, patients are very feel very marginalized by that. Um, and we need to send a message to our staff that we need to be as much about psychological care as we are about actual physical care, I think, as well. So all the care needs to be person-centred um, and not about what we think is what the person wants, but more about what um, they want and what their aims are. For some people, they don't actually want to lose weight, and I'll tell you that. Um, and all they want to do is get home. Um, and how can we facilitate that? And it's about individualising care according to the individual patients. Think about in your uh, procedures, uh, any legislative requirements that might uh, be applicable. So I'm thinking about things like no lift, um, et cetera. If you, have the, if you need to address that, you might need to include that in your procedure as well. Um, the other thing about, um, one of the things that we talk about in our procedure is that if we might need to uh, move patients out of their own uh, clinical area into another area that's more suited for their care, uh, this is pretty challenging for staff. So if we send a surgical patient to a medical ward all of a sudden, uh, just because that's got better facilities for the patient in relation to bariatric um, capacity, um, staff really worry about that. They worry about their ability to care for a patient outside their normal skill set, etc. But if you've got the backing um, and, and have a uh, go-to team to support that process, then that obviously makes the whole thing um, a lot easier. The other thing is um, bariatric equipment takes up a lot of um, space uh, and you need to have a uh, an executive or a governing committee that's brave sometimes in that they would make, consider shutting a bed. Uh, if you only have access to a, a four bed bay and you need lots of equipment for the bariatric person, it may be that they actually need to uh, shut the bed next door to facilitate care of that patient. And uh, in, these day, in this day and age where you have high bed capacity, um, that actually is quite brave and, and takes a fair commitment from executive to um, make that happen. So this is an example of something we've set up for our bariatric referrals. And this could be adjusted to anyone's facility or service. And it really is something that I just made up, um, thinking about what's, what things do I normally hear that are challenging about the bariatric patient. So you can see that everything on there is, is something very basic. So we talk about off-bed mobility, on-bed mobility, how does the patient transfer, what's their cognitive function like? And I think that's one of the most important things on this form. If you can't get your patient to cooperate with you and they are of size, then that's a major issue because there may be some uh, failure to comply with or are able to ability to assist, et cetera, with instructions. Uh, and that can um, pose a lot of risk both for the patient and the staff caring for them. So um, I pick very basic things, uh, everyday things that um, staff on the wards in, in care areas, et cetera, would find challenging, and then ask them just to rate the patient's, um, uh, where the patient is at on this form. 
from this, there's then another form, um, which I'll show you in a minute, that we, will guide me. Uh, this form guides me as to whether we might need more in-depth view of the patient. So if the patient score is mostly not applicable than ones, um, then I may or may not go and see that patient as an in-depth review. Um, it will depend a bit on where the patient's being cared for and what I know that the area's clinical experience with bariatric patients is like. Um, if they're very experienced and they've scored mostly not applicable than ones, I may or may not go and see the patient. But if the patient's um, very dependent and uh, with the high BMI, et cetera, I would almost certainly go and see them. And then I would um, go and conduct a bit more of an in-depth um, assessment of the patient and think about what um, sort of extra equipment, care, et cetera, um, that they might need um, to facilitate their journey throughout their, their stay. Um, so you can see down the bottom, it's very simple. Do they need any sort of uh, specialist chairs or wheelchairs? How are we going to move their bed around the facility, et cetera? Um, this is actually a double-sided form, I should say, and I've only got one side there. So on the back, um, we actually talk about how we would transport the patient if they needed to be moved to another facility. So um, I actually come from a, an area where we would uh, often transport via air. Um, so is that even an option for us in some instances because of the limitations of aircraft and helicopters, et cetera? Um, so I would then go and conduct this assessment and, and try and facilitate access to equipment as need be. Now, some of the patients might just need a wheelie walker supplied, whereas others will need the bed, the wheelie walker, something to move the bed, a hoist, a sling, et cetera. So it just really depends on what I find. Um, and what the patients are presented with, uh, how we'll manage them as we um, move down the track. I think a capable workforce is really, um, and this is taking us all back to this triangle thing we were talking about before, um, a capable workforce is a really um, uh, important piece of the puzzle. Um, I don't think we should make assumptions that half our staff intuitively know how to manage a bariatric patient or that they're the same necessarily as a, a, a normal, a more normal sized patient. Um, bariatric patients often have very um, different patterns of movement or how they uh, do their day to day activities. So something as simple as hopping on a bed um, might look very different for two very diff uh, different bariatric patients. So depending on how they carry their weight, whether they have panis, a, a large panis, um, whether they've got a lot, a lot of adipose tissue between their thighs, et cetera, um, movement patterns can be very different amongst this, um, uh, this uh, part of the community as well. Um, so I don't think we can assume that staff automatically know that. So um, when someone's walking with the patient like the physio or someone like that, um, are they actually uh, impeding the patient's movement? Because often they can get, get a very rocking movement if they've got a lot of adipose tissue between their thighs. And it's not something that we just know. Um, it's something we need to learn about. You need to think about what staff um, might require in the way of training. So is that just about equipment? Is it about knowing um, uh, what risks uh, there are specific to the bariatric patients? So bariatric patients often have a lot of skin issues. Um, they might have the mobility issues. They uh, can also have a lot of issues around um, uh, nutrition as well. And, and people are often quite surprised by that. Um, but we need to think about their training, um, what would be available for staff and what might be required. Um, manual handling training is obviously very important. Um, and if you have a, a, a program like No Lift or how do you train your staff? Do they have their competency re-evaluated? Does that uh, manual handling training even incorporate use of things that um, may facilitate manual handling of the bariatric patient, things like um, uh, lateral transfer devices and, and getting people up off floors if they've fallen, or is it just very basic about the use of slide sheets, et cetera, which may or may not be appropriate in um, bariatric patients. Um, so we talked about that. Uh, do they need additional um, tools to support care? Because we've got to remember that not, um, not all the time, we don't have exposure to patients necessarily all the time. And we often lose um, some of our expertise be before we see the next patient. So what sort of things can you do to facilitate um, uh, care of future patients and so that we don't have, we're not sliding all the way back down the mountain again? Um, so some of the things we've done in the past is develop little um, safe work practice guides um, so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel um, sometimes 
uh, when the next patient comes. So this is an example of a patient who again came in with a cellulitis of their lower limb and um, the patient actually didn't have their dressing done for about two days and when I came along I said why is this and they said we can't lift his leg. He was a 300 kilo man and um, they, they couldn't quite figure out how to lift his leg and, and, and dress the leg in, and bandage it etc. So we just worked on developing something really simple how we would use a hoist to lift the patient's leg up while we did the dressing and, and very um, lots of pictures make it easy for the staff and make them um, so they can see what they need to do. Um, and this was another one where we were standing a lady who was, had quite a large panis. The other challenge with her was that she only had one leg, um, but she wanted to try and um, still stand periodically. So we had to work through how we were going to do that training for this lady. But because we don't always have the same nurse or the same operational staff available each day, um, this was put up in her room so that we could repeat this day day. And the other thing is that we always try and do in this situation is engage the patients where they um, where we can and get them to help staff with, um, and offer their expertise because the patient's the one constant in this uh, whole process. And if we can if we can tell them how we're doing things and why we're doing that, they can actually pass that message along um, to the staff who are caring for them next. So little things like this that make it easier for your staff to provide care um, are, are really useful, I think. Um, so I think getting your patient on board, as I say, is um, really important. Um, and if you have all the, the governance and the well-trained staff and the specialist um, equipment, they're part of your trust account to getting the patient on board. It's really hard if you, um, to mobilise a patient who, um, when you've got a tiny little physio next to you and maybe a small nurse as well, and you go, okay, we're just going to stand you out of bed. Well, how, what are you going to do if I go to fall, etc.? But if you then have a piece of equipment in front of you that this is what we've got this here for and this is our plan and this is how we're going to do this, um, they, that's part of building your trust account. So engaging the patient at that point, showing them that you're well prepared um, and, uh, and they will start to work with you a bit more. There's um, uh, some, I think there's something to be said for a case management approach for all these patients. So um, we've certainly tried this in the past. Um, and I think you need to think who needs to be on that team. And I think one of the most important people you can sometimes have on that team is your uh, is a psychologist. Um, you can get some resistance from some of your bariatric patients, I think, at times, because sometimes they're quite socially isolated um, and they've learnt their own routines at home um, and they um, very much are set in a way to do different things and they, and they haven't, um, it's caused no problems for them at home, but it's not necessarily how we would work um, at a hospital where we are bound by legislation that says we have to do things in a certain way as well. Um, so having a psychologist on that team is part of um, working with your patients um, and, and gaining that trust. Um, people like your physios, your OTs, even your product resource advisors, I think. Um, so when you're needing specialist equipment that they um, have some sources to point you in the direction of, um, because invariably there's one more piece of equipment that you need that you don't have. Um, so having good access to those people and knowing who your contacts are in that world is um, a very important part of um, the puzzle as well. Um, sometimes in the past we've actually used contracts for some of our bariatric patients who really did not want to engage in care. Um, so people who know I'm fine at being this weight and you just get me home. Um, and there was no way we were getting some of these people home if they didn't engage in the care that we were trying to provide, be it dressings or um, mobility, et cetera, um, because we couldn't safely send some of these people home. And so contracts um, we would use in a way, well, if we can get you out of bed in the morning for such and such a time, and then at lunchtime we'll put you back to bed and you can stay in bed till this time and then we'll get you up again. But if you don't hop up, then there's not some other carrot that, and you've got to find whatever the carrot is for the patient, I think, as well. Um, what What is motivating the patient? And I just, you need to think about whether going home for the patient is a motivator, because in some instances it can be a, a very big motivator, in other instances it's not at all. Um, a lot of bariatric patients, especially the significantly bariatric patients, uh, tend to be quite socially isolated and um, they either love it or hate it in hospital, um, especially. Um, so they either get to have a lot more contact because they felt very socially isolated but didn't necessarily want to be that, 
or they, there's way too many people around them for their liking. So that going home may or may not be a motivator. It might be that I want to go out in the sunshine. I just want to go out or I want to um, see my dog. Um, can you please bring them up to see me for the day? So it's little things like that um, and working through uh, contract uh, agreements like that that may help you um, move forward in the patient's um, experience. I think we all, we need to start small, so take any wins you can get in the initial phase. Um, if you go in thinking, oh, I'm going from hit, uh, naught to 100 in one go, I think um, that hardly ever works. You um, need to really celebrate small things. Oh, great, you got out of bed today. Um, but you didn't get, and, and don't ignore that they didn't get out of bed for the second time. It was so good that you got out of bed for the first time today. Um, you missed one, we'll try for two tomorrow, et cetera. Um, There'll always be roadblocks in your way, and that might be that the patients had a um, a deterioration in their condition for whatever, or that a piece of equipment's broken down, and now you can't use that, so you can't uh, work through your plans as you're going to. Um, but yeah, you need to have some sort of plan for those roadblocks, but don't think they're going away entirely. So this is, I suppose, uh, now tying in, uh, hopefully you'll be able to tie some of this stuff into uh, bariatric mobility. And if we don't have some of those uh, processes in place, um, how um, we can impede and, and end up in our situation with Maureen where a relatively simple diagnosis ended up with an 18 month hospital stay. And essentially with mobility, um, you've got to move it or you lose it basically. Um, bariatric people are often used to having quite a lot of weight through their joints and you take that weight away by putting them on bed rest for a while and all of a sudden they're like, oh, hello, that's nice and I'm not going back to where I was before. Um, so we really do um, prioritise movement. Um, if I get one of my bariatric referral forms um, and I see that the patient's a significant weight and got some limitations on mobility, one of the first things I'm giving them is a chair and a bed that will facilitate movement, etc. cetera. Um, so I now prioritise movement above a lot of other things um, because if we get that wrong in the first instance, we, it really will keep, uh, send us backwards. So um, as I say, you may have a um, develop some sort of mobility algorithm or um, and I think you need to do those assessments when your patient first comes in and find out what they're actually capable of when they first um, come. Often what we do is we let this patient come in and then we take over everything. So the patient might be able to assist rolling in bed, but all of a sudden we've got four operational staff there doing it for them. Whereas it would be far better to use the patient and two operational staff so that we're maintaining that joint um, mobility, et cetera. Um, doing little uh, assessments of their um, mobility before we start to get them out of bed. If a patient can't lift their legs off the bed and can't cooperate with you, then it's probably best not to try and stand them at that point. That would be a mistake. That would be um, losing your trust account that you've gone towards developing because there's a chance that they'll fall. Um, and that can have very serious implications for them. So um, there's all sorts of little um, movement uh, algorithms out there that you can assess. Um, so things like uh, moving your arms up, obeying commands, lifting your legs off the bed, um, being able to push away, etc. cetera. Um, so all those sort of things are really useful and um, will uh, give you some information about where you need to start your mobility um, from. Um, I spoke a little bit about understanding bariatric movement patterns earlier, and I think that is very true. Um, if you watch two different bariatric patients get on the bed, it can be quite different. Some pa people actually kneel on the bed and then roll over, whereas some will um, sit on the edge of the bed, flop back and then uh, move their uh, legs over or get someone to assist to move their legs onto the bed. Um, and it can very much depend on how the patient's carrying their weight um, or whether, uh, so whether they're really round with a hard um, abdomen or whether they've got a very large soft panis that's hanging to their knees. Um, so you do need to have an understanding about that, whether they've got lots of adipose tissue um, that gives them a very wide stance as well, um, because that can be very challenging when we go to mobilise patients as well. Again, back to, it takes a, a, a team of experts or a team of people willing to help, I suppose, to get this all happening. So your allied health, again, your OTs, your nursing staff, et cetera. Um, and if you don't have the equipment that you need to support these mobility programs, um, then you're in all sorts of trouble. 
Um, and that can be simple things like having height adjustable beds or um, uh, specialist chairs, etc., hoist, mobility aids, and it's not just one mobility aid, it can be a range because as people um, uh, move through the course of their illness or they may need, um, they may start on a single point stick, may need to move up to a wheelie walker, um, or they might start on a forearm support frame and then be down to a wheelie walker to a single point stick. Um, so you can't just have one piece of equipment to fit all, um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, do you have any equipment that, that will facilitate? Um, if your patient can't mobilise, what are we going to do um, to get them exercising while they're in bed, or et cetera? So things like arm bikes or hand weights or um, bed ladders, things like that are all important to um, keep your patient as mobile as possible while they are restricted to their bed. Um, and patient gowns, I think, you know, that's a really simple thing, but um, it's not if you're a bariatric patient and you're walking down the hallway with your bum exposed. Um, I think that really simple things like that are a part of engaging your patient and having that respect for them again. So I'm not going to read through all these, um, but and there's two whole pages of this, but you can see um, if we don't get our patients up and around, um, that uh, the implications are quite severe. Um, and when I talk about dependency there, it's it's people being dependent on people to get to a bathroom, to go shopping for them, um, to pay bills, et cetera. And that's all um, quite psychologically, um, can be quite psychologically damaging to patients as well. So here's another page of um, things that um, happen as well if we don't uh, keep people moving. Um, and I think the decreased endurance, increased fatigue is a big one and all the cartilage destruction. Um, and that's why people don't move as much as they should, could. So um, again, the functional ability assessment prior to mobilisation, can they lift their legs, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, calling the cavalry. Um, so our uh, manual handling tra training coordinator will always come across whenever we call him and we'll work through troubleshooting um, specifics with uh, a variety of patients. So, um, and, then, and it can be very different. It might be, how am I gonna get this patient off the floor if they fall, or how am I just going to get this patient to mobilise to the toilet? Um, and how am I going to be able to get them through the doorway that might have been um, uh, designed for a much smaller patient and, and equipment that's not quite as um, large? I think before you I think about mobilising, um, nutritional adequacy is also essential. Um, so. Even to this day, I still see uh, bariatric patients come in and nursing staff um, putting them on a reduction diet. Um, and most of these people come with a condition, uh, some sort of illness that um, means that they have in actually increased caloric requirements. The average hospital diet will go nowhere near meeting these patients' uh, nutritional needs. Um, it takes a lot more calories to drive a larger body. Um, so these pa patients often need um, assessment by the dietitian for actual supplements as well. And I think staff in general really struggle to get their head around that. Um, and so I think selling that message um, and keeping the patients, um, because they can get quite fatigued and weak and stuff like that, um, and they can be quite um, micronutrient um, deficient as well, I think. as um, So, um, and we actually have a um, bariatric uh, protocol for nutrition when a, a bariatric patient comes in. So it can be things like off trolley supplements, et cetera. Um, the other thing I think with mobility is we really need to make it easy for um, both patients and staff uh, to make right choices for mobilisation. And often that means is having the right equipment available, but having it close by as well. Um, so if I've got a patient who's laying in a bed and the um, wheelie walker is in the next ward, I'm less likely to go and get it. Um, whereas if it's just outside their door, um, and I acknowledge that space is a very difficult, um, uh, a challenging space, I suppose, for especially if you work in uh, any sort of public hospital, um, there's never enough storage. Um, and But if we store these things away from the patients, there's the temptation not to use them. And that then exposes us to risk um, for the patient. So they may fall or they may injure themselves in some way, or the staff may injure them as they assist the patients. Um, so that's got lots of implications um, in relation to injury, etc. So we do need to make it easy for everyone to make the right choice um, 
before we start to mobilise these patients. So um, I think what equipment is required, um, it's not just for acute inpatients. So um, I've tried to set most of our waiting rooms up that we have a chair um, uh, that is uh, sufficient to um, uh, for a bigger patient to use in our, in our waiting room. So even in like our phlebotomy um, collection sites, um, in our maternity waiting area for our clinics, um, in our allied health clinics, et cetera, there's always at least one or two bigger chairs in those areas. They're often got smaller patients in them, um, uh, but you know, just to make sure that we do have that sort of uh, capacity. Um, I think we all always need to remember that one size doesn't fit all, and I'll show you some of those, uh, some pictures about that in a moment, um, because we can have someone who's quite tall and of significant weight, um, and then that really short patient who may weigh quite a lot less, but um, being short and bigger, um, their feet may not touch the ground, or they, they, because that makes them wider and they um, don't fit between arms on chairs, etc. So you will need a range of equipment generally, um, and um, you just need to have an understanding of your clients and, and work out what that might look, work, um, look like. Um, the other thing I think is really important is, is your equipment labelled with a safe working load? And my stance is now I won't buy any equipment that doesn't have a safe working load labelled on it. Um, I think uh, we run a lot of risk uh, in that regard. Um, and often times I, what I strike is patients actually wanting to bring equipment into hospital that they use at home. But you'll often, they may do that and you won't be able to find a safe working load on that. We actually have a um, duty of care to provide uh, equipment that we know is safe for a patient. So often I'll have that equipment taken home and, and say we can't legally do that, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, uh, certainly if you're looking at equipment, I would suggest that's something you're talking to your suppliers about. And if they can't supply that information or aren't willing to put a label on it, then I think you need to look a little bit further. Um, how do you manage equipment in your facilities or how do staff access it? Because um, unfortunately, uh, often what happens is it's late in the day or you've not had any advance warning that this bariatric patient's coming. Um, so then your clinical expert may not be around. Um, so how do you communicate with staff about where equipment's stored? How do they access it after hours? Um, how might I find information about how the equipment works? Um, because again, remember, it might be a long time since they've used the equipment. Um, and then again, who are your allies? Um, who's going to help you? Often, uh, if you work in an, a hospital, your operational staff often become quite good at this. So your OSOs, your orderlies, um, uh, they'll often know where the equipment is. They'll have seen it hiding away or they'll have used it before. So, um, and I think we need to value the um, input that these, pay, uh, these uh, staff often have as well. Um, so that's one of the things. And then, so this is an example of some of the equipment um, that uh, we keep. And I've actually, um, I try as much as I can to colour code my equipment. And um, and that's not always possible, I'll, I'll say that. So you can see up the top row, there's a lot of reddish maroon colour. So maroon is my preferred colour for bariatric equipment. I can't always get that happening. Um, but I, where I can, I'll always ask if uh, there's a fabric that is, fits into that colour range. It just makes it a little bit easier for staff to go, oh, that could be bariatric. And size doesn't always necessarily give it away. In, in this instance, it does in a lot of occasions. But you can look across the front, um, across the top of the slide there, you can see that there's four different chairs. And, and that's only part of my range. So that's certainly not, that's just patient chairs. So I've certainly got waiting room chairs that are outside that as well. Um, so we move across like levels of dependency of the, of the patient. So for a patient who's quite mobile and I want to keep that mobility, I might start with the maroon chair and it's on my left and I'm a bit dyslexic like that. So it's the um, simple chair um, was the maroon chair. Um, so that's about keeping the patient mobile, but the back at rest on that chair slides back so I can accommodate the patient's blue till shelf. I've then got the, the next maroon chair in, it actually will lay flat. Uh, so that if I needed to slide the patient over from the bed, I can do that and it's height adjustable. Next chair, again, it's it's got some um, electric features, but it will, well, it's not height adjustable, so it's not appropriate if I need to uh, get my patient across from the bed or back into the bed. Again, it's got quite a, um, a deep seat, so it may not be suitable for someone who's quite short or I, might, or I need to think about how I'm going to manage that if the patient is very short. 
And again, my um, last chair on the left there, um, we've actually only had this for about 12, 12 months or so now, but this uh, chair is fully, um, it's got a drive on it as well, and it'll take the patient up to about 300 kilos. But you can see on the black cushions, I've taken that last, there's a black cushion that uh, sits right down against the seat. I've actually taken that out in this instance to accommodate a gluteal shelf on a, a bigger patient. Um, so you will need a range of equipment. You can see that we've got gowns, we've got pickup frames, wheelie walkers, etc., cetera, um, and hoist lift pants, et cetera. So I think one of the things that we did when we first started on our bariatric journey is we established a priority list of equipment that's required, high, medium, and low. And high, our high was very much um, very basic equipment. If a patient landed here tomorrow, what would we need to uh, keep them uh, clean and comfortable and safe? Um, so think things like a, um, a bed that is of uh, adequate capacity for the patient, uh, somehow to attend to hygiene needs, or whether that's a, um, a shower chair or a, a bedside commode, et cetera. And then you, so there's and a sitting out chair and a wheelchair probably. Then you move on to and things that are more medium capacity. Um, and I'm thinking then uh, some of the more, our other mobility aids. So yes, um, it might sound like it's a really high priority, but um, I, I, we had to prioritise and, and very much it was about getting the patient into a bed and being able to attend to their hygiene needs was where, where we started. We certainly moved through this medium list. So we've got lots of different chairs, we've got lots of different scales, et cetera. And then it, low but high. Um, so it, in an ideal pie in the world sky, you'd have um, hoists um, uh, in all your ceilings, et cetera. Um, but unless you've got a, a little leprechaun and a um, big pot of money at the end of a rainbow, um, then that may be something you work towards in the longer term. Um, again, you need to consider not just uh, patients, but staff and visitors who access your facilities. So often you'll find um, uh, visitors coming in who are quite large. Do you actually have some chairs in your uh, next to the patient, et cetera, where a visitor could sit safely as well? Um, because we do have a duty to anyone who's accessing our services. Um, what other limitations might affect um, equipment purchases? And certainly I think we've, anyone who's ever bought equipment will have been bitten by this in the past at some point. Uh, thinking about doorway widths, um, and I've just recently bought a, um, a bed and uh, it's really difficult to get through some of my doorways. And I thought I was pretty good at this stuff by now, but um, not quite as good as I thought. Um, what about accessing your building? How is your patient going to get into a building? Do they have to come up a step or is there a ramp that they can actually come up? Um, is there any associated equipment that also needs to be purchased? So if you've bought a lovely bariatric bed, has it got an inbuilt bed mover in it um, or do you, do you need to purchase a separate bed mover um, to be safe, et cetera? So you need to think about um, anything that might be associated with those um, uh, things. What about your workforce? So that's again about the training of your workforce and how they know to access equipment. Um, and equipment storage, as I say, it is really the bane of all our existence, I think. Um, but having somewhere close by to put that equipment is essential. Um, and uh, so that patients uh, can get it very easily and, and well, staff can access it for patients very easily, I think. Um, and I think having some sort of uh, equipment storage management process, uh, so I run an equipment service. So what we try to do is um, I manage all that equipment so it comes back to a central area um, so that wards aren't having to store it. Um, and we find that we get fairly efficient um, use of our fleet that way. So instead of every ward maybe needing one or two beds and not use and using them for maybe patients who aren't necessarily bariatric, um, because when someone comes in the middle of the night and there's an empty bed, I'll just put them in that one. Um, if they come back to me and my some sort of a, a management process like that, um, that they get used efficiently. And so you get really good use out of your fleet that way. It's always in use. Um, you don't have excess numbers. Um, and wards aren't having to find um, extra space there. Um, the other thing about equipment in the bariatric um, space is that it may need more um, frequent maintenance as well. So when we think about things like metal fatigue um, and things like that. So for example, our 
and uh, regular beds at my facility are on a 12 month maintenance schedule, but our bariatric beds are seen every six months by our um, bed maintenance team, just to make sure that they're um, functioning correctly and that there's no signs of wear and tear. A lot of this equipment's really expensive as well, so it's well worth um, having eyes on it a bit more frequently and um, ensuring you can maintain it and not let it get damaged beyond repair um, where it's out of action for a long time, especially if you've only got a one, one bariatric bed. Um, I'm fortunate to have a lot more than that. Um, but if you've got one, you really need to cherish it and look after it and, and maintain it well. Okay. Um, so I actually have a fair bit of passion about this next bit and about the well-designed um, environment for your bariatric patients. So um, I think one of the things that often happens is um, that we don't get that early consultation with clinicians who are actually using spaces. Um, so it could be uh, in an acute facility, it could be at a community facility where uh, we see a lot of bariatric patients, et cetera. So um, some of our diabetic clinics that might be out in the community, et cetera. Um, thinking really early on before we've even put pen to paper, what's our, what's our clientele look like and uh, how might they need to access us and what's, uh, what will be their pathway um, and flow through our service, um, then we can get things right a lot more um, than we do now. Um, so I think one of the things, um, we're often constrained, especially if we're in a redevelopment space as opposed to a, um, so redeveloping existing spaces, I should say, as opposed to building new spaces. Um, it's very difficult to work around things like plumbing and redesigning where walls are, etc. cetera. Um, but if we can get in um, before uh, even there's anything uh, from that initial build, that's a really good place to get in. Um, I think when you're talking to your executive staff about building capacity for bariatric patients, if you sell it as not just for bariatric patients, but for more dependent patients, um, and I'm thinking about people who've had uh, heavy strokes or CBAs, et cetera, um, people who may um, have had a spinal cord injury and be ventilator dependent, et cetera. Um, all those things often need a very similar space requirements because there's a lot of equipment that comes into the area, et cetera. Um, then it's a lot more palatable to your executive, your governing um, bodies, et cetera, if you can sell it as a multi-purpose, multi-use um, uh, concept to them. So again, you need to think about access through the facility. Um, and so when I talk about that, things like going from the ward area down to the ultrasound, down to the medical imaging department, down to um, outside if they want to um, go out in the gardens, et cetera. Um, so you need to think about all that access. You need to think about safe working loads of fixtures as well. So if you're putting grab rails up in, a, in an area that um, you want to be bariatric, then you need to think about what is the weight capacity of those grab rails. Um, you need to be thinking about your toilets, etc. So if you're planning on using that space for bariatric patients, what weight does the conventional toilet take? Is it just about the, pan, uh, uh, the bowl itself or is it about also the seat? Um, and I think when we get into this, um, area we often hear, but that's what the facility guide, uh, design guidelines say. And, but they are just guidelines and you need to really advocate for your patients and understand what your patients look like and how it's um, keeping both your patients and staff safe um, that you can argue for changes in those guidelines. Think about the circulation space in the clinical areas you'll be using and how you might improve on that. And I think bathrooms are where we really need to do a whole lot more work around um, because bathrooms are, you know, being wet areas, they uh, set us up for um, falls, etc. cetera. Um, and there's often, uh, if you fall in somewhere like that, there's often things like a ceramic toilet that you're gonna really hurt yourself on or a basin, et cetera. Um, so really hard fixtures onto tiles, etc. So getting things like that right um, first up uh, is very important. Um, so even having too little circulation space can actually increase your risk of um, falls, et cetera. So we were playing around one day just down in the foyer of uh, our auditorium area and we, we thought, oh, we're gonna have a look at what space looks like. Um, and so we've got a bariatric bed in there and you can see the inner white line is what the size of our um, current rooms are. So um, the, and the little white things on the floor are things like cupboards and um, basins, et cetera. And um, 
and we thought, oh, that's probably not quite big enough. But if you look to the slide on the other side, where we've then added all the bariatric furniture. So we've added a bariatric table, a visitor's chair, a, a forearm support frame and a sitting out chair, et cetera. Um, then look at all that, how that space has now um, been made even smaller. And look, if you, uh, we've actually put on the outside uh, lines what we would think would be a better circulating space. And you can look how not making the room a whole lot bigger has um, increased, um, would increase our circulation area around that thing, around that um, space. So, okay. Uh, and um, Arjo actually have a really good design guidebook. So if any of you want to get a hold of this, I think um, this will really illustrate this. And what they've done really well, I think, is talk about the different body habituses of patients and different levels of dependency. But you can see in this, this is essentially the same size room. And you can see that in the first picture, we've got two people standing side by side and it's pretty tight. But in the second picture, we've just got one person. And simply by that person being bariatric and adding a bigger bed, we've actually really reduced our space around that bed. Um, so we, um, I think if you can get a hold of those guidelines, I think that they're really useful. Um, and it talks about, you know, turning spaces, et cetera, because um, you can see if I was um, in the first picture, I would struggle to get uh, maybe a bariatric wheelchair or something past the end of that bed. Um, whereas if I um, then added that a little bit of extra space in the second picture, how much would it be easier, uh, easier to move that past the end of the bed? Um, and this is um, some examples of some different facilities I've been to around the place. So a couple of photos from Canberra, um, some from Prince Charles in um, Brisbane, and a couple from my own facility. So the toilet down the bottom and the bathroom and that um, is from one of my own facility uh, ward areas. Um, again, we had to do that um, once the plan was already done. So we had to retrofit essentially, even though it was a new build, um, I was told I could have this as a bariatric room, but the plumbing was already in place. So we had to work around that. Now that's always really challenging and much harder to uh, get right. Um, then when you can say before they've even drawn a single line on a piece of paper, um, it's much easier to get it right at that point. Um, and this is an example of where I think we really did get it right. Um, this is in one of our subacute uh, building areas. And it's a little bit hard to understand this plan, but essentially it's two rooms that are joined together and they've got a bathroom at the front. Um, there's a uh, overhead ceiling hoist that um, is uh, goes from both rooms and goes right through the bathroom so that the patient can move from the bed area into the bathroom. And I'll show you a couple of photos of me. Um, it was actually a video initially um, when we moved in here. And that green line is the pathway that I actually am taking. So you can see I'm about to leave the bedroom and go into the bathroom. And I'm in a, uh, just a, a supported vest at the moment. Um, and I'm a very compliant patient. Uh, and I might have stretched that out to look a bit skinnier. Um, so you can see here, um, and this was an example of us um, changing guidelines, etc. in that um, picture down the bottom left, um, that the toilet has got is not next to a wall in any way, shape or form. It's really hard for patients of size to be sitting beside walls and then having nurses and stuff trying to bend around and care for the patient in that situation. Um, Things we did get wrong in this, um, and you will invariably get some things wrong. And if anyone's willing, to, uh, wants to get in contact with me and help, uh, I'm more than willing to help you learn from our mistakes that we've made. In this one, they put the buzzer right down near on the wall where the actual toilet brush is there initially. Well, that's hardly um, going to work for the patient. We redesigned that. Um, those rails actually dropped down beside the toilet, and we redesigned the rails so that the buzzer is now incorporated into the rails. You can see that I can go from the toilet over into the far corner of this room and there's more than enough room to accommodate a bariatric bed bath or the patient can stand in there. The rails are all weighted um, uh, as well. Um, but you can see that it's quite a large room. And 
that's actually the end of my presentation. Um, I don't know that every um, bigger patient is trying to not be a bigger patient, um, and it's not my um, thing. Our reality is that we do have bigger patients and we need to um, look after those people when they come into our care and do the very best. They deserve it uh, every bit as much as any other patient, client, etc. cetera, um, and we need to have strategies for that. So just a couple of references there. And um, we have about five minutes left for questions. So um, I'm going to hopefully, um, if there are any questions that are there, um, send them through. So it's, it's. <laughs> uh, the size of the toilet is something that's written there, I think. Um, it really depends. Um, on um, most of our toilets now are, are weighted up. Oh, okay, I'm getting some technical help here now. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go up. Just give us a sec, guys. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so one of the questions here is talking about um, problems of VTE prophylaxis. Um, I, as I said, manage an equipment service. Um, so one of the things that I do is I actually have a range of uh, uh, thromboembolic stocking. So um, you'll have things like, um, you'll have a very tall, large patient, then you'll have someone who's very round. Um, and often uh, any sort of thromboembolic stockings, they can cause problems, and especially in your shorter patients, and that they tend to roll. Um, so you need to, I have four different stockings on my shelf. Um, that I keep. Um, I also have bariatric garments for our sequential compression devices um, and uh, we loan them out of my department. Uh, so it is actually, you're right, it is really important um, and that's one of the ways we manage it. Um, sorry, I'll just I'll scroll up. Someone's asked me about um, classification of bariatric but I think I've already um, handled that. So I'll just scroll down. Um, we don't actually have a bariatric clinical nurse specialist, so that would be I might I am probably our expert in our in my health service, um, and I work very much with our manual handling coordinator um, to um, work through that process, um, and then we bring in other experts as needed. So it might be the wound management uh, nurse, uh, etc. If we've got specific problems there, I am. I've, probably forgot to mention that I also am the clinical lead for standard eight, so prevention and management of pressure injuries. So I have a, a, a bit of an understanding there and certainly skincare is big on our radar. It's um, a massive problem in this um, population and I actually do a whole presentation on that usually as well. So, um, sorry, I was just gonna to try to read. <laughs> I'm, and if anyone wants to contact me, there's a thing here, would I consider sharing the bariatric assessment forms? I'm all about sharing information. Um, and if and if anyone ever wants to share stuff that they've done with me, I'm more than happy to see it. I um, uh, am happy to credit things like that as well. Um, so I can, I'm can. i still very much learning in uh, this space as well. And I think um, will be for a long time because um, the challenges that these patients said are very unique and um, very varied and they can vary from these two last ladies I've had both been about 260 kilos they were the easiest patients I've ever had in that in that space because I was super cooperative but if I'd had a 180 kilo person who was quite dependent who was less cooperative it could have been far more of a challenge for me um, so they all, are all very different um, so whoever wants to contact me um, through uh, an RJ will be able to put you in contact with me if you, anyone wants those bariatric assessment forms I'm happy to do that um, I'm and people are asking me about the presentation I have no qualms about sharing my presentation so I'm happy if that's shared um, uh, I don't have any specific tools for um, skin assessment. Um, I um, We tend to do that on a day-to-day -day basis um, as we require, and it's a head-to-toe, um, top-to-bottom, front-to-back sort of approach that we use very much that we would use for pressure injuries. Um, training largest staff training is difficult in this space um, because often there's gaps in time um, when you will um, 
uh, have patients. And so we'll, we'll have developed those lovely little work practices for like for our one-legged lady who was, had a large panis, and then we might not see that patient for another year or two. Um, so it is always challenging. Um, uh, we uh, will often offer it uh, we try and involve our operational staff as much as possible in that uh, instance, I will say. Um, sorry, I'm just... Okay, we've got to go. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to run out of time. If anyone would like access to the presentation, uh, please contact um, the college or Arjo, I think, and um, we'll be able to share that. Um, and um, yeah, any of the equipment stuff, happy to answer along the way as well. Happy for my contact details be shared around. Thank you. Thank you.